debt of gratitude to probably half the people in this room, which I would like to acknowledge. Um, my mantle is to speak about outcomes in the Western world, so I'm going to be presenting you some data from some large um, population-based data sets, which come from Canada, France, and the United Kingdom. Should look the number of collaborators. I'm going to start out by asking you to think three-dimensionally, so it's my um, dimension here to talk about muscularity, um, that is uh, muscle um, appropriate for stature, but um, I'm going to dive into the body, body mass index and weight loss to begin with. So um, in, in the Western world, represented by Edmund in Canada, um, where it's happily possible to a survey very large population cohorts of patients. So here I have, for example, nearly a thousand of our most recently referred uh, patients with non-small cell lung cancer in stages 3B and 4. I, I think that uh, Gallagher's images from a recent paper rather than a good representation of the profile of body mass index, the population mean is just a hair shy of 25. And um, uh, my point, I suppose, is there's pretty much nobody who presents as clinically underweight in this population, and it has a huge, great skew in this direction. Here's the uh, demographics of weight loss in the same group of people. Um, so the mean weight change at presentation, this is talking about their pre-diagnosis, so this prior to diagnosis history of weight loss is 6%. Um, about 15% of the patients report having stable weight during the last six months. Um, a few have clocked a gain um, most recently, and then there's a weight loss, which is a very huge skew from anywhere from 2% to maybe even 30% in some individuals. So these are our two conventional features or dimensions of, of body weight that we think about in cancer cachexia. Um, um, up the ante here, I've managed to collect a um, rather larger data cell set of help from my friends, and this is now a mixture of people with advanced stage uh, cancers of the GI tract or uh, respiratory tract. And this gets a, uh, allows us to have a chance to look at uh, really the relationship between weight loss and, and un outcome in oncology, its overall survival. And so I've just taken these 4,100 people and divided them into 10 groups of 410, and um, here is the demonstrated relationship. Um, so the units on this axis are um, a hazard ratio. Um, and every time the gray scale covers, there's a P difference in between those blocks. So we see the weight loss basically anywhere about 4% is continuous related to survival, and also the BMI less than 26 is continuously uh, related to survival. So the um, least risk categories are respectively uh, weight stable um, or having a high BMI. And with these things being independently prognostic of survival, I think I think the best way to think about these two things is simultaneously. So with a sample size that's great, it's possible to look at the relationship between cell survival in, and weight loss. And now with 16 cells in, in, in one, two, three, and four different BMI strata. And not too surprisingly here, uh, again, you're looking at a, a representation in units of hazard ratio. Um, the least risk category is to be big with a small degree of weight loss, and the highest risk category is to have low BMI with a great degree of weight loss, and that kind of weight scoring scheme discriminates. For example, in non-small cell lung cancer, um, a median survival of 13.9 months for people in this cell, and a, a median survival of two months in that cell. So that's just a, a background picture. Now, to the, get to the point of, of looking at the muscle, um, my probably favorite theme song is the divergent um, behavior of muscle and adipose tissue, something that we spend a lot of time looking at uh, using diagnostic images. Um, and we exist in oncology in a paradise of diagnostic images, which are collected anyways um, for patients at presentation over time and are housed archives in most of our hospitals, and they give us the opportunity to look at um, not just muscle, but many other components of the body with beautiful precision and, and, and beautiful specificity. Um, I'm going to be now showing you uh, several images, 
And we use the third lumbar vertebra as a point of reference um, for comparing different people to each other for the reasons our scans are not whole body and for the reason that um, um, others, especially referring to Wei Shen's work, have shown that um, muscle areas and adipose tissues areas at this level are a good surrogate for the whole body values of muscle and adipose tissue. So then you can take people and have you like the, the magician who saws people in half and you can compare them for muscularity on different bases. So here I've just shown you my three women who have uh, the same stage of cancer, which is metastatic, and the same height and weight, making them identical in body mass index. And then you can begin to grasp the degree of variation. And I've not chosen the first percentile and the 99th percentile um, for this characteristic. These are more like the 25th and the 75th percentile for these characteristics. So you can easily see you can have one height and one weight and all sorts of um, levels of, of muscularity. <coughs> And here's my other three poster children. These are three women who actually have an identical total lumbar muscle cross-sectional area, but a slightly different overall body weight. So having at, adapted to those methods, it's possible then to take a large group of people. So I, I would confess to having analyzed possibly um, seven to 8,000 images in the last couple of years. And um, here I'm representing you for one sex, a, um, a frequency distribution of this measure, lumbar skeletal muscle index, so it's muscle cross-sectional area um, normalized for stature, just to show you that um, it shows a wide variation in men with non-small cell lung cancer. Um, they're very muscular, or on the other end of the scale, not very muscular. So here comes shoot me, if you like, my definition of the sarcopenia for the balance of my presentation. Um, um, so if you have, you can have lots of muscle, or less, or less, or less, or less, and at some point, one imagines, if you think muscle is attached to any health risk or outcome, that at some point you can show a statistically increased propensity um, for something like mortality or toxicity or physical disability. So that is indeed the way I define sarcopenia as I go on in my presentation. Um, I should say something. My definition of sarcopenia, referring to Bill's talk, is closer to type two or grade two sarcopenia than to grade one in the scheme of things. Um, now I'm going on to ramble about some implications of severe muscle depletion focusing on some data from my group and um, some conjectures we're making at the present time. So the first thing we did was uh, we took, uh, as described in this paper, we took obese patients, this is qualified by having a BMI of 30 or above, um, with solid tumors of the GR respiratory tracts, and we split those people into sarcopenic and not sarcopenic, and detected uh, a quite important difference in survival. So the median survival was 11 versus 21 months, and that, that prognostic value of sarcopenia uh, was independent of age, disease type, stage, and performance status. Um, we did another work of that ilk in pancreas cancer patients with Benjamin Tan and Ken Fearon. And here I'm showing you the survival discriminants of this group here. So it's the overweight and obese, some proportion of which about 16% uh, um, have sarcopenia. And <coughs> the sarcopenia ones having a significantly shorter survival, again, adjusted for uh, other clinical features as usual. Um, just to show that we're not entirely oncocentric, um, with other researchers in my center, notably um, um, Aldo Montanaloza, who's a hepatologist, and Michael Sawyer, who's a clinical pharmacologist, um, we looked at cirrhosis association with mortality in a cohort of patients who are on the transplant list. So this is um, hepatitis of etiology, um, uh, uh, HCV, alcohol, autoimmune, HB, and, and Others and uh, these uh, folks demonstrated that sarcopenia was independently prognostic of survival and, and independent of both the child pew and the model for end stage liver disease classification schemes, which are used to prioritize people from the transplant list. So, this could be of some interest. Um, back in oncology, and I, I'd really like to acknowledge the uh, material uh, input of Michael Sawyer on all of this work. 
work, we've started to stratify people uh, treated with um, cytotoxic therapies and other therapies uh, according to sarcopenia. This is one of our first works. So um, metastatic breast cancer, we're receiving cytidine on the following basis. So this is adjusted for height and weight at 1250 milligrams per meter squared. When we stratify those patients according to sarcopenia or not, we detected a, almost a two-fold <laughs> difference in the prevalence of severe toxicity, which meant these criteria, um, greater than or equal to grade two, but most important, <laughs> resulting in the inability of those people to receive their full course of therapy. But almost uh, identical study to this one also published in clinical cancer research where we uh, looked at uh, a different fluoropyrimidine, which is 5 for a cell, in a different patient group, colorectal cancer patients, so I don't see exactly the same findings. And um, how far we're now to a completely different class of drug. So here we have serafinib, which is target therapy. It is administered as a flat dose, so no adjustment for height and weight, to renal cell carcinoma patients. These were participants in the target trial. And I am to Ned Bernard Escudier, our, our collaborators from that in France. Once again, when we stratified by sarcopenia, we found 37% uh, um, versus 5% dose limiting toxicity um, in, in this treatment. And as you might expect um, for a drug that's flat dosed, the smaller people, so that's the um, below the median body weight, they get a bigger dose of drug just because they're. And we, as you might have expected, got an even greater widening between the incidence of dose limiting toxicity in the sarcopenic <coughs> and the non sarcopenic. And I would like to say that almost all of these patients dropped out permanently from treatment altogether owing to human foot syndrome. Uh, here's some new findings that we've been working on as yet unpublished. This is a multivariate logistic regression, patients with colon cancer. Uh, uh, admitted for resection, again stratified by sarcopenia, and here we find that looking at this list of infectious complications during the hospitalization, um, the sarcopenia explained um, about a fourfold elevated um, risk of getting one of these infections <laughs> in a model which includes sex, cancer stage, and primary tumor site, and as Bill would tell me, this would be a no-brainer, is um, looking at these ICDO codes for um, inpatient um, um, convalescence and, and rehabilitation care. That um, sarcopenia was also about a, <coughs> associated with three times um, larger risk of, of having a longer uh, hospital stay for those reasons. And the overall length of stay for the sarcopenics is 20 days versus 13. Um, now I get clear, near to the end, so bigger into the conjecture part. Just a couple of things that we're thinking about <coughs> actually now. Um, and this is something that's led by Michael Sawyer, who's here. Are you Michael? He's supposed to be here. He's always late. Um, anyways, you can meet him at this meeting if you would like. Um, he's thinking about this. Um, um, anybody who's worked in muscle for, for any length of time knows that uh, um, muscle, mass area, whatever you have, is, is close correlate to 24 hour creatinine clearance because that's where creatinine comes from, right? And I, I guess what Michael Sawyer is thinking is, whoops, well, if you're estimating the glomerular filtration rate using um, equations such as the Kropotkov Kro Kro equation, um, um, you're basing your estimate on, on the age, sex, and serum creatinine, it could be that someone who's really sarcopenic doesn't have such good kidneys as they appear to have, it's that they're just not making much. So um, those, that's something that we're pursuing at the moment. The last thing I'd like to just briefly get into is I've talked about demographics of body weight and, and, and BMI and weight loss and muscle. And with Rachel Murphy, who's a, who was a PhD student and has now gone up, abandoned us at the postdoctoral fellowship with Tamara Harris, we spent a lot of time thinking about these demographics in comparison to the inclusion and exclusion criteria for many clinical trials on cancer cachexia. And, and it, it, if, if you gave me a set of inclusion and inclusion criteria that touched on these parameters, um, I could give you a result. So here's my um, thousand cancer patients, lung cancer, not supposed to lung cancer patients in Edmonton, and they have certain prof profile performance status. And um, if, if they would never, so the performance 
performed the status for and three have never included clinical trials, but many clinical trials in cancer cachexia at the moment also in exclude performance status too. So you can see what number of patients in the population can be pushed out by those criteria. With the BMI profile, uh, nobody is including obese patients as the number of obese patients start, uh, continues to expand. 15% um, uh, of patients or so are not included because they're too fat. And then on the other end, many trials exclude patients who are too thin because they have a poor prognosis. You knock off the wings um, of, of this. The percent weight loss, an interesting criteria, non small cell lung cancer in my center and a center in England and France. About 45% of the newly referred patients have not had a 5% weight loss. So best part of half the patients go straight out. Um, and what's driving it is the good performance status patients um, tend to be in this end of weight loss distribution. So this just gives an opportunity to um, judge clinical trial criteria against the realities in some of these populations. <coughs> and as far as including this sort of thing in clinical trial criteria, I don't know when we're going to be doing that, but hopefully sometime soon. So my conclusions are these, um, that first of all, the diagnostic images are a real resource in oncology for following some of the things we're interested in, that there is a bewildering degree of variation in weight and muscle, that muscle depletion predicts survival, toxicity, the outcomes of surgery, creatinine production, and then um, maybe one day we're going to get to this. And I simply encouraging everybody I meet, especially all oncologists, um, to not consider all of these patients to be 